Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the MCM Rosero Game Stage. <laughs> Thank you very much, folks. We have an absolutely amazing session here, completely exclusive content in this. It's never been seen before anywhere. Well, except within Square, but that doesn't matter. Um, so basically, I'm going to welcome to the stage Alejandro from Square Enix, who's a game designer on Life is Strange, to give you an inside look at Life is Strange. Going to get a huge round of applause. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Oh, quite loud. Um, Cool. Well, my name is Alejandro, as I've uh, been introduced now, for now. I'm game designer at Square Enix. Um, I've been in charge in, uh, of uh, the episodic adventure that you all know called Life is Strange. Uh, my goal in the next 30 minutes is kind of like gives you kind of like an insight on how we use storytelling in the experience that you all had um, with Life is Strange, hopefully, and enjoyed. Um, hopefully, great as well. Um, but before we, we move on, how many of you have played Life is Strange? Cool, that's awesome. How many of you finished it? Okay, nearly the same amount. Good. Um, and how many of you like adventure games or narrative games at all? Nice. Okay, same amount. That's awesome. Um, so now, for the ones of you that you haven't played Life is Strange, this is going to be a bit spoiler heavy. So, sorry, folks. But hopefully, it's going to make you want to play a bit Life is Strange. So, without further ado, let's, I'm going to show you a small trailer of this full season of Life is Strange. I am. What are you doing? Get that gun away from me, psycho! No! My name is Max Caulfield. I'm 18 years old. Years ago, my family moved away and I left behind my childhood. After five years, I'm back in my hometown, Arcadia Bay, Oregon. Now I'm studying photography at Blackwell Academy, my new home. In the end, it's still high school, which kind of sucks. Then there's Chloe. Home, shit, home. Let's dance, or take my picture with your new camera. Then something happened. Something that changed my life forever. Max, what's going on? Where am I? There's something else I have to tell you. Holy shit. Talk to me, Max. Oh, no! I discovered I could reverse time. Max, start from the beginning. Today, you set off the alarm. Destiny. You hella saved my life. Don't ever touch me again! Another shitty day. Then I realized I had a choice. Hey, you okay? And the power to change everything. If I see you here again, you'll learn all about real trouble. So, what would you do now? Cool. So, before I dive, uh, dive in a bit more into Love is Strange, let me introduce myself on how I ended up working in Love is Strange. So um, I studied computer science in Spain and, uh, because there the industry is a bit small, so I moved back to London where I learned about English. And then doing a master's degree here, I learned about game design. Soon after, I joined a company called um, Digital Chocolate where I did a lot of tons of mobile games like Pac-Mania, Tower Blocks. Um, after that, after some time working there, moved to Gamelot doing a big, bigger uh, games like Blitz Brigade, which is kind of like a Team Fortress game or, or Asphalt series. Soon after that, I got recruited by Square Enix to work on free-to-play games, but when uh, Donald approaches 
with uh, Life is Strange, one scene on Life is Strange, I just fell in love with the game and I said, well, you know what, I need to work in this game, however the cost. Um, and then, yeah, I ended up working there, basically. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to work there is, apart from the story that I just read briefly on Life is Strange, is how I like and I love storytelling in games, and how it's a new medium for telling stories uh, in a very different way and how can we reach uh, people in a very different way. So, well, um, when I joined the project, there was a lot of things already that we knew about Life is Strange, uh, but we had a, long, a lot of com long conversations about how we were going to tell the story to make it you know, resonate in everyone, entertaining and kind of touching. So basically, in order to do this, we had to ask ourselves a lot of questions about story. And then once we knew what story, how deep it was, then we went into designing the scenes that you all played. Um, so keep in mind here that um, this is the approach of working on narrative games. So it's not the same for doing an FPS or a third person shooter. The reason for that is because I'm going to say stuff like gameplay is not as important as story, and some people will, that's not true. It is true in our case. So, well, um, so we had kind of like a nice idea at the beginning what we wanted to tell, but as I said before, we wanted to resonate. So in order to do that, we created what we call a premise, which was what is the main idea? What's, you know, we know more or less the story, but what is what we want to tell on the story? What is the question that everyone needs to answer? Once we had that, we went to define all the main characters. And to do that, we wrote a, a big document uh, on every character, main character, with their age, gender, likes, dislikes, beliefs, what, uh, how morally they were, what's the backstory, back the place of birth, if, what the religious belief they had, um, and more importantly, how they answer the premise, okay? And even how they interact with each other, even if they never met in the game, because every one of them has a strong personality, they needed to have something to say to each other. Once we had all those characters, we went into creating the main story arc for the whole season. Okay. Once we had that main story arc, with all the beats per story per episode, we went to creating a bit kind of like a high story arc per episode. So it's like working like six times, but not giving a lot of detail. That was not set in stone because. Once we release every episode, basically we listen to the community and we change things, we change scenes, we even change dialogues, we change a lot of stuff to react to what people like, what you guys didn't like. So that was very important to us. Um, so of course, once we had all that, we wanted to talk about gameplay. And what's important with gameplay is that the gameplay needed to answer our premise. This, everything feels like a bit ethereal right now. So I'm going to give you how and what this means for Life Strange. So the, our premise is what means to be an adult. The whole season is what is to be an adult. Okay, That was the most basic question for us. Now, when we created the characters, how I'm going to give you some examples on how they answered. For example, Max, to be an adult, she needed to accept the choices she's doing. She needs to stop looking to the past and move on and accept what she decides. In case of Mo and Chloe, she needs to accept her new life and let go of William and that life needs to move on and, do do and she needs to as well. For, Jeff for Nathan, is actually breaking up with the family, be someone on himself, you know, not live up to other women's expectations. For Mr. Jefferson, is live life with an artistic vision, whatever that entails. Um, and for David, is the most important thing for him is guard and save his family at all costs. Okay. 
Then for gameplay, we use exploration on point and click, kind of classic gameplays. But our main new gameplay was Rewind. And how that answers our, our main premise, how Max actually is using Rewind, actually it doesn't help because it makes her doubt a bit more. So every time she does rewind on the first episode, she keeps asking herself, did I did, did do, uh, do this right or not? Did I actually, was this the, the good thing to do? And if you notice, the more you progress on the series, the less she starts asking those questions. And towards the last episode, she never asks if the, if the choice was a good choice or not. She accepts the choice that you, as a player, are doing. So, and of course, once we did all that, what we went on is doing exactly the same for secondary and tertiary characters. And I'll give you examples. Victoria, for example, for her, it's becoming an artist and at any price. For Kate, it's being strong and relying on family and and friends. For Dana, is choose the right person to spend her life. For Daniel, is understanding that he's good art and how he can express art. So, interesting enough, we created for every one of those characters a story arc that you guys can explore or not. It's not the main path, but all of them have a beginning on the first episode most of them finish fourth, ep fourth episode or fifth with them answering, answering that question, basically. And ha you are kind of like the, the way of them discovering this question. OK. Well, so once we had all that, we know the story we wanted to tell. But what sort of tools do we have for that? So and again, this is a very big simplification on how we approach designing this game. but we had what we called environmental storytelling. And we used puzzles and gameplay to express that story we wanted to tell. Those two are actually concept arts that we use when we were knowing that, for example, we were going to go into the RV of Frank. We gave it to an artist there. And because he had the biography of Frank, he knew how to kind of sketch that scene, what life has Frank lived up into that moment and what we can find in that place. Same with the Vortex Club. Before we reached there, the party had started already what happened there. So. so let me explain you what environmental storytelling is. Uh, kind of like we knew what it was, and we were trying to find a nice definition for it. I'm going to read it because it's very odd and formal, which is sta uh, staging player space with environmental properties that can be interpreted as a meaningful whole furthering the narrative of game. That's from a GDC talk about environmental storytelling. I found another one that's even better that's called The Art of Putting a Skull Next to a Toilet, which I'm going to describe right now how, what that means for all, all of us, at least what it meant for Live is Strange. So, Basically, environmental storytelling is what we had to tell the story on the scenes that you guys experienced and how we did that, why we do it. First and foremost, for complementing the main story, secondary and tertiary stories, reinforce those stories we wanted to tell, just getting to a, to a scene and player experiences that just through a scene without talking with anyone. Um, then to reward curious players, that go and explore every scene, touching every environment, looking at every graffiti, and trying to understand what's going on here. So how we do it in our case. So we, have, we tell the story of what happened until that point where Max arrived to that scene. So for example, this is the toilet of the school that we had. This is one of the first sketches that we had. As you can tell there, that doesn't tell anything. But those of you that play the game know that it's full of graffitis, it's full of posters, and every single one of them is being left there by a person. Yes, we know the person that left it there, the reason to leave it, and what that means at that point in time. 
Okay? And that goes for every single scene that we use in Live Strange. I'll give you an example later on. Then, of course, through how we reward players, through inter interpretations, basically. So you go to um, graffiti that says a hole to another universe that probably some of you have seen. Um, and you guys start wondering what that means. Is that connected to the main story? Is that connected to any story arc? Maybe yes, maybe not. So you guys need to figure out what we're trying to tell you there. And of, of course, uh, like interactions, you can go on the world, pick objects, and read text, read notes, read SMS messages, and kind of understand what's going on. Of course, sometimes what we do as well is grab interactions and give you something that's very cryptic that you can try to interpret what's more into that. So for example, in episode two, you can find a letter from Rachel on the young yard referring to someone that he, she met that she was deep in love and that she was going to run with that guy away and that she was afraid of telling Chloe about that. So you guys can interpret who was that person, why she was afraid of uh, saying that to, Ray, to, to Chloe. Okay. Woo. Okay, so I'm going to give you a nice example of how we use that environmental storytelling to tell something without talking to anyone. So this is spoilers. Kate room in episode two. You enter her room. She's a very religious person, but she's in a deep depression. And as soon as you enter this room, the light is dark. Everything is untidy. You see that just for the mood, something is not right in this room. If you start looking at the images on the room, you can find a letter from her mom condemning her to hell for what she did. You can find a passage from the Bible that she likes, one she dislikes. Um, you can see how tormented she was up until the point that Max arrived to this room. And you can just gather this information without talking to her at all. Of course, you meet Kate back some of you, in episode four, on a hospital, okay? As soon as you enter this room, you see that it's full of light, full of color, and everything that happened from episode two to episode four, here's told through the notes. You get a note from Victoria apologizing. You get the notes from the schoolmates uh, saying that they actually want to hire back. Um, so you get a lot to what happened to this character between these two episodes. Okay. Another nice room that we spend a lot of time doing is Chloe's room on episode one. If you remember uh, here, you can go to different corners. For example, there is one corner where you could see just in the first episode that she had someone called William that seems that he disappeared from her life and up from that point, she scratches everything that's on that wall, like nothing else matters to her, not growing up anymore for her. Another thing that's important is that you can find in one of the, of the drawers uh, some pictures that Max and Chloe did when they were young. That means that she still remembers Max. She's not holding a grudge to her because she left. So there's some hope there. So, or even you can find when she was fired from the school in one of the shelves. All that is by just looking at the scenario. You can visit that room again in another reality in episode four, and you can see actually that her personality is completely different. She's not the same person. She never lost her dad, but that meant something big for her. But here, for example, you can discover that she had an uncle that you never knew about and that he was deeply concerned about Chloe. Just, again, coming here, looking at this, and just interacting with what the environment had. Of course, all the things we have to tell the story was puzzles and gameplay. In this, we, use, we divided the gameplay into two, what we call classic and pure narrative. Okay? In our case, we thought the story was way more important than gameplay. But that doesn't mean that you cannot have a challenging gameplay or interesting gameplay. For example, we use kind of 
fetch quests to help players explore the environment. Not just to collect uh, a note on RV of Frank, it's just to look at every single detail on that RV and trying to understand who Frank is. Logic puzzles, for example, you need to move Victoria from the, from the door. Why we did that is because in this case, you get to know Victoria. Maybe you are mean to her, maybe you're not. If you're not, you'll discover a soft side to Victoria. And of course, we have memory puzzles where you can gather some information and use in other episodes later down the line. That is the same, makes you aware of what people like and dislike on this world. So I'm going to give you a big example of one of the puzzles that we had, which was the detective board on episode four. You needed to kind of um, figure out where was Kate at a certain, morning, a certain date um, on a specific uh, place. Okay, So what we had here is we had different pages with latitudes and longitudes and times for different cars. And every latitude and longitude was perfectly crafted to tell the story of that character. For example, here you can see Nathan and someone, not us, I didn't write this, someone in the internet went into it, um, decided to check where he was in every single one step of this. And we wrote that story for Nathan, why he was in the diner, why he was at the, at the gas station, why he was at the, at the forest, on a state, okay? And that for every single car that you can see there. Same with, for example, Chloe and Jefferson. And if you start comparing that, you can already tell what's going on. You can look at the notebook of Frank and you can know what sort of drugs some characters take, when they take it, maybe it's related to the studies or not. Okay, so we told a lot of stories on this just very simple puzzle. And for us, another type of, uh, of gameplay was pure narrative. And that is, for us, dialogues were pure puzzles. And what that means is that they needed to serve a purpose. Okay, so when we went to create dialogues, first of all, we asked ourselves, what was the purpose of that dialogue? why we wanted that dialogue there. Then we thought on how much Max is going to interact with that person. We don't want to create a movie or big monologues where people get bored and feel that they're not part of a conversation. Of course, how many branches we're going to have and how rewind is going to affect that, part, that conversation. Okay? And if we have fail states, how difficult then the conversation will be if we have those sales states. Then I'm going to show you something quite interesting now, is one of the conversations we had in Love is Strange was with Frank. And this is an overview on that conversation. And I'm going to show you a bit more how complex is that sort of conversation. OK, let's see. So let's see if I can now. Put this back down. You're not seeing anything, is it? Awesome. Hmm. Give me a second. Let's see. Yes. Cool. That was the initial idea for that conversation with Frank. Uh, it seemed very complex, but we discovered that here, if you were setting a path, you will end up always with the same result. It didn't matter how much you will change that conversation. So what we did here is we ended up making this conversation look like this. Hopefully, you can get it. And I'm going to show you more in detail how that actually looks. Woo. Nice view. Cool. So when you approach this conversation, what we had was First here, as you can see, we had who has, uh, Chloe can have a gun or not have a gun. Frank can have a gun or not a gun. A dog could be there or not be there. Max could have shot Frank or not. 
Max might know that Frank has a picture of Rachel in his pocket. Max might know that Frank rescued his dog from a dog fight or not. That's all the things we knew before we started this conversation. So, and we added that if you see this conversation, we wanted things to change. So, if you had that conversation before, you can rewind time and start that conversation with Chloe. And what happens here is that you can tell Chloe, Chloe, you know what? You have a gun, do you? Throw it out. So, throwing that gun out meant that the complete uh, outcome of that conversation might change. Or you can tell her to be nice to Frank for once. That will mean that she will talk differently to Frank than what she did in the first time. Okay? So the next thing is that they might have money at this point. At this point, Frank will ask, do you girls have the money? If you don't have it, she'll start, he'll start getting angry. If they have it, you still have the chance to say, no, don't give it to him. If you do, he'll get happy and you can move on on the conversation. But then if you experience that conversation again through rewind, you can tell Frank, you know what? Your dog might do a mess here. Could you close the door? And at that point, again, the whole outcome of that conversation changes big time. Now you can tell him that you don't want to fight, but he'll say, yeah, whatever. And you can tell him that you don't want guns to be used. Because, but because you use guns on the second episode, he'll get mad at you again. So you can screw up several times here. Then, of course, he kind of like made a note on what happens on episode three where you stole his keys. And here you can say, well, I'm sorry, Frank, you lost the keys. Or you can say, yes, I took it from you. If you do that, then he'll get angry and you can finish the conversation here. If you don't, then as you can see here, for example, this is how different Chloe will speak, depending if you told her to talk nicely to Frank or not. Okay? And at this stage, actually, the conversation could finish, and you will never see anything else of the rest of the conversation. Out of that, he'll, he'll start talking about if you shoot him or not. If you didn't shoot him, then he'll say, yeah, OK, no problem. Let's carry on to the next kind of time subject. Otherwise, you need to excuse yourself why you pulled the trigger on that conversation. And here, you need to be truthful. You were scared, and you just click the trigger. Not that it's good, but you know, at least you're honest. If you don't, of course, he'll get angry at you. And you, what you want from here is to get some information. Then he talks about Pompidou. Pompidou is his dog, and that dog could be hard or not. And then he'll tell, he tells two different stories. Then if you learn that he rescued that dog from a dog fight, you can say that to him, which is kind of like a perfect answer because you acknowledge that he loves dogs. If you don't, you can still get it right, but it's a bit more difficult to guess. Okay? Then, of course, again, Chloe getting in the middle, as always. Um, but then you start talking about basically, um, let me see, with Rachel. Your purpose being there is that you want to discover what Rachel where the, where the whereabouts of Rachel, and you need his help. And if you know he has a picture, you can tell about that picture, and you can tell him that, you, that he cares for that girl. And you, the three of you care for that girl. So that's an easy conversation in. If not, you can still talk and convince him that you care and he cares, and then everything will go all right. At that point, if he has the gun, he'll give it back to you, and that's the end of the conversation. If not, that's what happened. So, depending who has the gun, Frank could die from a gunshot. Frank and the dog could die by a gunshot. Chloe could get bitten by a dog. Then you need to rewind, because you don't want anything bad happen to Chloe. Or you could stab Frank on his leg with his own knife. And that's how complex just one conversation on this game was for us. Okay, cool. Let's try to go back. Presentation on. Well, I hope with that you got a nice view on how we went into creating Live Strange. 
Thanks, everyone. And if you have any questions, I'd love to answer. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, guys. Hello? Hello, there we go. Right, I'm going to wander into the crowd. Uh, we're going to take questions from the audience, and we're going to take questions from the Twitch chat. So what we're going to do is we're going to alternate from me to Rich, me to Rich, me to Rich, me to Rich, Brilliant. Uh, for the next 10, 15, 20 minutes maybe. Um, let's start here. Look at that. Eager. Question. So um, during the game, you are make sometimes believe like you can save other people, and then you are seeing that you can save the people. And one of the moments that were really heartbreaking for me was the moment of the euthanasia. Yep. You, have, you don't have like a neutral choice, it's either this or that. Yep. How did you get that idea? Because it was really polemic between my friends and everybody. We were fighting like, oh, why did you do that? Why did you say this? So interesting enough that we had kind of like a, nearly two months of discussions with what we wanted to do there. Because we all want to have our, our say, and we didn't want to push anything. And you know, sometimes in life, you cannot say, I don't want to answer this. So sometimes in life, you need to answer something. You need to give a hard answer. Even if you don't want to, sometimes that's the right thing to do. Just say something. Whatever is your choice, you need to live with the consequences of that. So for, our, for us, that was very, very important that you get to choose at that very moment. Excellent. Rich? Question from the Twitch chat. Yeah, we've got a question from Killer and Ollie and Star. They've all asked a similar question. Uh, what was the kind of thought process into selecting the music for the game and how did you go about securing those tracks? So, to be honest, as I said at the beginning, every character has his own likes and dislikes. And what we did is like every character, for example, um, Amanda Palmer is being listened by Chloe constantly, okay? So we knew one scene from her needed to be with Amanda Palmer. Then that's one side of the things. The other thing is when we wanted to portray a sentiment, we kind of like drink from all our influences and what is right for the game and that scene. And then we look for it and what it felt right. Then, of course, we talked to the musicians and we see if that was okay. Of course, we went through a lot of legal checks, but the idea was that the music needed to complement the story we wanted to tell in that exact moment on the story. Hopefully, that answers your question. Wonderful. Right, question down the front here. Hi, what is your question? Hi, uh, um, so my question is, uh, what were the advantages and disadvantages of um, having an episodic game? Oh, wow. Um, advantages is actually talking to people. You know, guys, you play the game, you make theories, you tell us what you like about the episode and what you don't. And we listen and we change things. And then the story is no longer our story, it's actually your story, and, and we like that. We really, really like that. The disadvantage of that is that it makes a lot of pressure because you guys want the episode tomorrow. <laughs> so we don't have all the episodes and we release it when we want. We just do one and as soon as that one is finished, we start on the next one. So that means a lot of pressure to make it right, to make that awesome quality that you guys expect from us. Uh, having that script done on time so you guys, you know, experience it the way, the way you want it. But, you know, if I have to do it again, I'll do it all over again, to be honest. I love it. Wonderful. Right, another question from the Twitch chat. Go ahead, Rich. Do we have a question? The mic's not on. Has the mic died? Can we, can we give him another mic? I'll give him my mic for the time being. Rich, go with the question. Hold on. Okay, it's from Elite Nemesis. How long did it take to ensure that each conversational path had a logical path to follow, and how did you keep track of all those decisions? Oh, wow. That's a... Uh Hold on. That's yeah. the million dollar question. So um, we test those uh, conversations tones of times, like really, really tones of times. We rewrote with Christian Divine all of those texts. We run through a lot of people. We did focus groups to different people to check if that made sense. Then we had kind of like a huge, like nearly a wall of an Excel tracking every single choice everyone could do. 
and then at a point, okay, so they are in this scene. Which choices could affect here? So he's meeting Kate, he's meeting Chloe, he's meeting William. Okay, so here we have this, this, player has done that. It was hellish, but very satisfying. When we got things together, um, I still remembering creating, like for example, the Dionasia that was mentioned before. We got very emotional when recording it, and I still get emotional, even if, if I did the game when playing that scene. I really, really thought we never moved until a, a script made us feel something for that conversation, basically. Basically, it doesn't sound basically. Well, we, I know, but it's kind of part of the magic, you know? <laughs> uh, question? All right, we have a question here. Oh. Hello, sir, what's your question? Are any of the lessons you learned from Life is Strange going to be used in Vampire? Wow, um, interesting question. I'm not working on Vampire, unfortunately, so I cannot answer that. But I can tell you that people tend to be good in terms of choice and consequence. So blurring the line of what's good and bad is always good. And it's evil, but it feels nice. Um, but as well that, you know, we need to listen more even to the community. We thought we didn't even, with, even though we listen a lot, we wanted to do more than that. So that was kind of like the main, main thing to do. And don't plan too much ahead for things. Brilliant. Rich, Twitch? Yeah, we've got a question from Marina Kunashir and from a few other people who asked, uh, can you give us any insights into animal symbolism in the game, specifically the meaning behind the doe and the blue butterfly? Cool. Uh, nice question. Um, so the doe for us was the spirit animal of um, Rachel. And if you look in episode two, the doe was actually standing on the grave of Rachel. And she was pointing all along Max towards discovering what happened to her and trying to make her avoid any danger. So for us, it was kind of that spirit animal to guide, um, guide Chloe, uh, Chloe, sorry, Max, towards the discovery of the end. In case of the butterfly, um, going to be very cryptic. Um, it's a mixture between colors and the butterfly effect, and that's all I'm going to say. What's with all the squirrels? There's a lot of squirrels throughout the game. Oh, well, you know, uh, there is a character that loves squirrels. Um, and you could say that that's his spirit animal, maybe, and he knows more than what he says. So, there you are. Brilliant. Do you have another question here? Just looking around. Oh, we have one for the Twitch chat, and then I will come back to you. So, Rich, go ahead. Okay, uh, a question from Ranger099 who asks, why did you choose to situate the game in the, the US and not France, <laughs> where the studio are based? That's a very interesting question. Uh, for us, it was about the story we wanted to tell. Um, some of the creative guys went into Oregon and fell in love with that place. The light that was uh, in some of the areas, and it really portrayed the way we wanted to tell the story, that light was kind of very key to how the story we wanted to tell. So that was mainly the reason, because the setting was perfect for us. Um, and it was, you know, through a lot of media, we know a lot about the US. So it's as well another good point where everyone kind of referred to, and it's easy, easily, easily identifiable for everyone. So that was more artistic than anything else, really. Excellent question. So at the end of each chapter, you were able to see what the community chose. And were you expecting anything that would uh, people would choose something and then they did something else? Were you expecting a reaction to some decision or? Yes. No? Yeah. So that was, uh, and we had a lot of talks about that on, 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 um, on the studio. So when Kate asked you for help on her room, you have the option to tell her to go to the police or say to her that you want to gather more proof. Okay. And unfortunately, I think it was 75, 76% of people decide to choose to gather for proof instead of what people should have done, which is 
if a girl or a friend of you tells, tells you that she's been date raped, maybe, or abused, the first thing you need to tell her is go to the police. And we didn't expect people to react that way, so we start asking questions to people why you react like that. And the main answer usually is like, because people, police may not believe you. And that unfortunately is true and it's sad. So that was kind of like a big, big impact for us because we didn't expect that to happen, to be honest. We, we think it was gonna be the other way around. But you know, that's society at the end of the day. That's the, the world we're living, unfortunately. Wonderful, I have another question here before we go back to Twitch. Uh, oh. Question. What ending did you choose? Oh, wow, wow. Do I need to answer that? Um, so, unfortunately, I chose to sacrifice Chloe. I love Chloe a lot. Um, but to be honest with you, I get asked that question. For me, that is a very difficult choice. And uh, what it means for us is you guys get to choose what's your ending. There is no one main ending. It's what you want it to be. It's your decision. As, accept that decision. You want to sacrifice the whole town for a friend? It's a good choice. It's a hard choice, but it's a good choice. You want to sacrifice your best friend or maybe girlfriend for a whole, a whole town? It's a tough one. I, you know, to be honest, I, I tried both, but my main one keeps being saving town, unfortunately. Sorry. Uh, I think we've got time for one more question from the Twitch chat. Go, Rich. Okay, Starscream asks, did the, story, the direction of the story ever change between the release of episodes based on fans guessing things, or did you largely stick to what you had planned out all along? So we did take to our story. There was a video around, I'm not going to mention which one, which was spot on on the theory on what was going on. And I remember seeing that video and going like, oh, Christ's sake, what are we going to do now? Uh, but, you know, it was one person guessing it, which is awesome, because we gave, we gave all the clues on the first episode, to be honest with you. So that was our fault. But it is not. So that's the story we wanted to tell. So we mainly stayed to, the, to that same story. We changed small things here and there based on what people wanted to see more and what people were comfortable with. Brilliant. Can I get a massive round of applause for Alejandro, please? Thank you. Thank you very much. That was Thank brilliant. You. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you very much, folks. Thanks for sticking with us. Is there any more closing yeah, remarks? Just one closing remark. Everyone that had done a question, if you can come next to me on the stage, I have a small thing for you guys. So, thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, folks. We'll be back in about 15 minutes with some Bandai Namco stuff. Stick with us. Thanks very much. Cheers.